Okay. So, <laughs> as tradition seems to dictate, the second recording of the series ran into a bit of a problem. So, I'm here to basically re record on my own uh, what we covered in the second, really the first actual session uh, for chapters one and two of Slaughterhouse Five. I'll uh, remember as best I can some of the comments that were made, some of the discussions that we had. Um, I did manage to catch a bit of the end that I'll edit into the end of this video. That is to say the end of the session that was partially recorded. <laughs> uh, okay, so without further ado, Chapters one and two. So uh, in the session zero, so-called, where I introduced everyone to this book, we mentioned that it starts off saying that uh, most of this is true, more or less, most of the book. Uh, I guess it's up to us to decide what's true and false, uh, what's made up. Um, he was indeed held prisoner during World War II uh, by the Nazis in Dresden towards the end of the war. And uh, he was present for the firebombing of Dresden, just to call back to that fact. So as our book opens up, uh, we hear about the trip that he made back to Dresden with a buddy uh, to visit his old stomping grounds. <laughs> I don't know if that's the best way of putting it, but uh, he goes back to you know see the slaughterhouse. Um, they make friends with the taxi driver. <clears throat> uh, later, the taxi driver sends them a Christmas card. I wish you and your family. Also, as to your friend, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And I hope that we'll meet again in a world of peace and freedom in the taxi cab. <laughs> if the accident will. Uh, first of all, I love the in the taxi cab. Peace and freedom in the taxi cab is what we all want. Uh, if the accident will. So he likes this very much. If the accident will. So I picked this out of the book because I think it's pretty important. Um, one of the themes that we see throughout uh, is just arbitrariness and uh, how things outside of one's control. Uh, well, <laughs> I guess it's silly for me to say can't be changed. Let's say the nature of things outside of your control, accepting things outside of your control, accidents, if you will, or even if you won't. Um, the phrase, so it goes, which we'll talk more about in the session, um, refers to things that cannot be helped, cannot change. And uh, the phrase is repeated quite a few times in the book. All right. Uh, this is a picture of Kurt from around that time. He's having a very difficult time writing about the war, about his uh, imprisonment or his prisoner of war period. Um, he decides to <clears throat> contact O'Hare. O'Hare is an old friend of his to see if they can drum up some memories. Um, There are these limericks that he mentions. Um, and yeah, in the session, we discussed them briefly. Uh, of course, uh, Kurt doesn't shy away from being a little, <laughs> let's say, salacious. <laughs> um, in fact, Slaughterhouse Five was 
banned quite a few times in the US uh, and in other countries for being, you know, maybe a bit ribald. Um, but, you know, sometimes in a very juvenile, silly way, as you'll see, <laughs> there, there will be more later. Um, so yeah, we want, we talked about why uh, these or how these relate to his his issues. So the first one is <clears throat> there was a young man from Stamboul who solilo soliloquized thus to his tool. You took all my wealth and you ruined my health and now you won't pee, you old fool. So for those of you who are not familiar with these idioms, <laughs> this is an ode to his uh, organ. Um, so what's the point of all this? Why has he put this in here? This is in reference to him <clears throat> trying to remember uh, the war, trying to remember what happened and realizing there's not much to say about it. He can't remember much about it. Um, so what would be his tool here? Well, I don't know, his brain, his imagination, uh, his memory. It's just not working for him anymore. Um, that's the object of his criticism. Um, never mind that peeing means coming up with a compelling story in this case, <laughs> something that he could write uh, and publish. The other one, my name is Jan Jonsson. I work in Wisconsin. I work in a lumber mill there. The people I meet when I walk down the street, they say, what's your name? And I say, my name is Jan Jonsson. I work in Wisconsin. Um, so this, uh, okay, so by now, if you're, hopefully if you're watching this, you will have read chapters one and two. So I'm not spoiling anything to introduce the Trafalmadorians who are aliens who live outside of time. Why am I bringing them up now? Oh, um, the, it says that they see a person's life kind of like a mountain range. They're outside of time. So everything's already happened and not happened yet simultaneously or is in progress. <clears throat> and uh, you could almost say that that's like a, a record, like a, an audio, like a music record. Uh, our character winds up, you know, jumping to different points in his life uh, throughout the story. He's uh, an unwilling time traveler. He doesn't get to decide where he goes or when. Um, so if you see it like a record and it's always the same song, it's just wherever the needle drops, that's the part of his life that he plays. And this repetitiveness, maybe it's something like the repetitiveness of a record. Uh, I don't know if that's it. <laughs> it's my theory. And by the way, we talked about how uh, he says it's like living in a constant state, state of stage fright because you never know what part you're going to have to play next. How can, I have a question about this that it's not clear. How can you have stage fright or be said to meaningfully play a part that implies you'd be able to change something. Um, but if you're outside of time, it doesn't seem possible. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. He talks to his publisher about his uh, Dresden book. And the publisher asks, is it an anti-war book? He says, sure, yeah. You know what I say to people when I hear they're writing anti-war books? No, what do you say, Harrison Starr? I say, why don't you write an anti-glacier book instead? What he meant, of course, is that there would always be wars uh, and they were as easy to stop as glaciers. I believe that too. I wanted to mention this because it, it harkens back to our previous reading group where we did uh, Camus' The Plague. And this sentiment is stated pretty directly in The Plague uh, that people know about wars and plagues. They know that they happen. Nevertheless, they're extremely surprised when they when they come about. Um, <clears throat> no one would say, or no one would be so unrealistic as to say that there will never be war again. Um, like the glacier, I mean, 
let's put aside the irony that maybe glaciers won't be a thing <laughs> in, in another century or so. Maybe they will, at least not on Earth. Who knows? He tries repeatedly to uh, put his story down on paper and uh, the best outline he ever made, he says, or at least the prettiest one, was on the back of a roll of wallpaper using his daughter's crayons. So we talk about how he has a, a wounded voice. He speaks like someone who's traumatized. Uh, and sometimes that comes off as being almost childlike in his expressions. And in this case, childlike in his behavior. I mean, you can imagine him sitting down at a very short child's table <laughs> to get busy with some crayons on the back of a piece of wallpaper to sketch out the story. <clears throat> Different color for each main character. One end of the wallpaper was the beginning of the story. The other end was the end. And then there was all that middle part, which was the middle. <laughs> Incidentally, that would be the largest part. <laughs> In fact, the entire surface of the paper is the middle part. This is pretty funny. Uh, because the beginning and the end, like the beginning and the end of a life, you know, only last for a moment. <laughs> the middle part is pretty much everything. <clears throat> everything in between, you know, a person's birth and death, that's their life. You know, that's all the middle part, which is in the middle. Um, the blue line met the red line and then the yellow line. The yellow line stopped because the character represented by the yellow line was dead and so on. The destruction of Dresden was represented by a vertical band of orange cross hatching. That's where you, you know, make little X's to, to do shading. <clears throat> All the lines that were still alive passed through it and came out the other side. Okay, this will come up again later. Uh, it reminded me for some reason of Henry Darger. Look up Henry Darger <laughs> if you feel like it. He was an unassuming custodian at a hospital who, uh, upon his death, it was discovered that he had been writing just bizarre fantasy stuff. He had 15,000 paged manuscripts. The reason I thought of him was because of the, he did these large, sometimes like 20 or 30 foot portraits to illustrate the, uh, the fantasy stories. So it just reminded me of the, the wallpaper. In this reading group, you'll notice we do digress sometimes. I've got another digression lined up for later. <laughs> Feel free to digress to some extent. Uh, there's a story of a man who was a veteran who, uh, this is when he, okay, when Kurt, our narrator, uh, gets a job as a journalist and finally gets to work the day shift, so to speak. Well, no, the day shift, not just so to speak, but the day shift. Um, <clears throat> and he covers this story about a veteran who had taken a job running an old fashioned elevator, uh, that would be, you know, an elevator with a valet in it. I guess, is it a valet, a bellhop? I don't know, elevator man, elevator boy. <laughs> Terrible superhero names. Uh, the elevator door on the first floor was ornamental iron lace. Iron ivy snaked in and out of the holes. There was an iron twig with two iron lovebirds perched upon it. The veteran decided to take his car there was some confusion about that. It means the elevator car, not, not an automobile. Take his car into the basement and he closed the door and started down, but his wedding ring got caught in the ornaments. He was hoisted into the air and the floor of the car went down, dropped from under him and the top of the car squashed him. So it goes, there it is. So I asked everyone to take note of when you see the phrase, so it goes. And you'll notice that it tends to appear after uh, someone has, after there's some reference to death or people just being horrible <laughs> in some fashion. Um, so what's the point of this? Well, we discussed the fact that uh, it's ironic. That's the point of it, probably. Uh, he made it through the war. Uh, he made it through, this veteran made it through probably, you know, insane things. Uh, Saw, saw all kinds of death and destruction, comes home, dies running an elevator. Um, not to mention the wedding ring <laughs> is what killed him. <laughs> and, you know, perched on the ornaments of love. Uh, that 
actually I should say caught on the ornaments. Uh, yeah, irony, irony, that's the point. <clears throat> Um, oh, by the way, his uh, colleague at the paper calls him back to the office and she's like, so what was it like? And he describes the scene to her and she says, did it frighten you? Did it make, did it upset you? And he said, oh, no, I've, I've seen much worse in the war. Uh, so yeah, he says uh, the war had made everyone very tough. He became a PR man at General Electric in Schenectady, which is by the way, I spent some of my early youth in Schenectady, upstate New York. This is a, not what you would, uh, when people picture New York, they picture New York City. It's not like Schenectady. <laughs> um, anyway, not to digress right now. <clears throat> he was also a volunteer fireman. Uh, his boss was one of the toughest guys he'd hoped to meet. He had been a lieutenant colonel in public relations. <laughs> I like that phrase. It's sort of saying, you know, let once the lieutenant colonel, always the lieutenant colonel. Now he's a lieutenant colonel in public relations. <laughs> While I was in Schenectady, he joined the Dutch Reformed Church, which was a very tough church indeed. He used to ask me sneeringly. For those of you who don't know what that means, a sneer is a sort of derisive, uh, not a smile, it's sort of lifting one side of one's lip in a sort of derisive fashion. It's arrogant. It's looking down at, at someone for certain. That's what it conveys. Uh, he would ask sneeringly why I hadn't been an officer, as though I had done something wrong. Uh, this is I've put this up here to contrast with the next part. My wife and I had lost our baby fat. Those were our scrawny years, like skinny, thin, wiry. We had a lot of scrawny veterans and their scrawny wives for friends. The nicest veterans in Schenectady, I thought, the kindest and funniest ones, the ones who hated war the most, were the ones who'd really fought. Hmm. So you've got the tough, sneering lieutenant colonel, and then the kind, funny, and war averse soldiers. Uh, this is a theme you'll see repeated. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> he finally makes his way to an old war buddy, O'Hare, hoping to drum up some memories about what happened in the war because he's unable to come up with anything. Uh, the wife, Mary, uh, as our participant Jovana mentioned, uh, not pleased about the visit. By the way, this is the slide that I accidentally forgot to include in the original presentation for those of you who might be reviewing from the previous group, uh, from the previous session. Um, yeah, she's not happy he's there. And we find out why the book is The Children's Crusade. She's, as they're talking, trying to remember something, anything, they're not doing very well. Uh, she's, you know, bustling through the house, kind of being loud, moving furniture, breaking ice in the sink, uh, obviously not very happy, but not saying anything. Then finally she turns to him to uh, let him see how angry she was and that it was for him. She had been talking to herself, so what she said was, a fragment of that conversation. You were just babies then, she cries to him. Uh, you'll pretend you were men instead of babies in your book, she's saying. She's accusing him <clears throat> in advance of writing something that will glorify war. You'll be played in the movies by Frank Sinatra and John Wayne, some of those other glamorous, war-loving, dirty old men, and war will look just wonderful, so we'll have more of them, and they'll be fought by babies like the babies upstairs. He brought his... Uh, was it nieces? I can't remember now. Daughters? Granddaughters? I, I honestly can't remember. Sorry. Uh, he brought two young girls with him, and they're upstairs playing with uh, uh, O'Hare's uh, kids or grandkids. 
Then I understood it was war that made her angry. She didn't want her babies or anyone else's baby killed in wars. She thought wars were partly encouraged by books and movies. Okay. So yeah, he promises her, no, that's not my intention at all. I, in fact, in honor of this discussion and in honor of you, I'll name the book, The Children's Crusade. They want to find out a bit more about the Children's Crusade. So they look into the book, Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. By the way, highly recommend that book. Uh, it reads very well for something that's, when I say it reads well, I guess it's uh, easy, easy to digest. It's, uh, it's fun. Charles McKay is humorous and the humor translates well into, let's say modern sensibility. The book is about periods in history when people just collectively lost their minds. Um, it starts off with uh, something about land banks. I can't remember, John Law. There are chapters on the tulip crazes. If you, uh, uh, by the way, those are still studied. There were lots of <clears throat> financial bubbles. So there's a, a good part of the start of that book has to do with uh, financial bubbles, the South Sea bubble, the tulip madness, people speculating on the price of tulips, you know, waking up poor, going to bed rich, and vice versa. There are chapters on the uh, uh, witch finders, the witch trials, <clears throat> chapters on the crusades, obviously, <clears throat> etc. Just check it out. It's quite good. Um, he says this about the children's crusade history in her solemn page. This is Charles McKay actually being quoted in the book. History in her solemn page informs us that the crusaders were but ignorant and savage men, that their motives were those of bigotry unmitigated. So bigotry without end, <laughs> unleashed. And their pathway was one of blood and tears. Romance, on the other hand, dilates upon their piety and heroism and portrays in her most glowing and impassioned hues their virtue and magnanimity. These are the exact words that will be used later for Roland Weary to internally describe his own behavior. <clears throat> the imperishable, I forgot to add that again to the slideshow. The imperishable honor they acquired for themselves and the great services they rendered to Christianity. Um, of course. Uh, there are descriptions of Dresden's past destruction. <coughs> it's not the first time that Dresden has been the target of some attacks. I picked out this one in particular. Um, Dresden under siege by the Prussians. There was a cannonade, so cannon attacks. Picture gallery took fire. Many of the paintings damaged. Um, the stately Kreuzkirch Tower, from which the enemy's movements had been watched day and night, stood in flames. It later gave in, succumbed. In sturdy contrast with the pitiful fate of the Kreuz Kreuzkirch stood Fraunkirch, uh, from the curves of whose stone dome the Prussian bombs rebounded like rain. So the Prussian bombs just bounced off of it. That's why I decided to to include that particular description because it's a good contrast for the fire bombing during which the bombs did not bounce off of rooftops harmlessly. Uh, this is a picture of him about when he's enrolling. <clears throat> I've told my sons, look at him, just, just a kid, you know. I've told my sons they are not to, under any circumstances, take part in massacres and that news of massacres of enemies is not to fill them with glee satisfaction or glee. I've also told them not to work for companies which make massacre machinery and to express contempt for people who think we need machinery like that. Okay. Sometimes I'm just filling in the story for people who didn't uh, read everything. So I want to make sure that they're, if you happen not to have done the reading and you attend the session, you'll still get an idea of what happened in the story. Um, <clears throat> there's more about not having free will here uh, as he gets stuck in Boston. This is when they're going to go to Germany, but their plane skips Boston. So he's stuck there. He says, I become a non-person in the Boston fog. Lufthansa put me in a limousine with some other non-persons and sent us to a motel. 
for a non-knight. There's something about being between worlds when you're traveling and uh, kind of like not existing in any world in particular. That's kind of how I interpreted this. Time would not pass. Somebody was playing with the clocks, not only the electric clocks, but the wind of kind. Uh, the second hand on my watch would twitch once, a year would pass. Then it would twitch again. It's a little foreshadowing of what's to come later when time starts to sort of break down for him. Um, or earlier, I guess earlier because it was first in 1944. I can't remember. There was nothing I could do about it. As an earthling, I had to believe whatever clock said and calendars. No choice, right? I mean, what use would those devices be if when you approach someone in the street you would ask them what time is it for you <laughs> okay uh he mentions a bit from the story of the destruction of sodom and gomorrah lot's wife was told not to look back if you guys recall the biblical story i'm sure you've heard it before those cities were destroyed for containing wicked people um some people were warned and told to get out while the getting was good. Lot's wife among them. She was told not to look back where all those people in their homes had been, but she did look back and I love her for that because it was human. Nice. She was turned into a pillar of salt. So it goes. He relates that to his own work. This is his finished book. I finished my war book now. The next one I read is gonna be fun. This one's a failure and it had to be since it was written by a pillar of salt. Okay. So he uh, clearly spent time looking back. That's why he's a pillar of salt, right? That was the conclusion, I think, fairly on the nose. Uh, it begins like this. I love how he does this sometimes. He makes reference back to th things that he's already said. He does callbacks. And uh, he, he tells you, here's what I'm going to say. And that's what he, exactly what he does here. He says, this is how my book begins. Listen. Billy Pilgrim has come unstuck in time. And it ends like this, pooty wheat. So he's told you the first and last lines of the story. Uh, nifty, right? Okay, then we meet our Billy Pilgrim. Uh, so yeah, the first chapter, of course, is just sort of biographical. Um, but then we start with the story, our Billy Pilgrim, who is, uh, we met him briefly last, well, the session before this first session, uh, chaplain's assistant, optometrist. Um, he's come unstuck in time. Uh, something has happened to him. He's drifting between different points in his life. Uh, he's spastic in time, has no control over where he's going next, and the trips aren't necessarily fun. He's in a constant state of fright, stage fright. This is what I talked about before, uh, because he never knows what part of his life he's going to have to act in next. Again, is there an implication that he could change the things and do things differently? I mean, if you were really outside of time, it seems like you'd be in a sort of eternal state. And uh, eventually you would have visited all the points in your life you know, millions of times and probably just decide to be catatonic. <laughs> or just why would you do anything? Did you ever see Groundhog's Day, that, that Bill Murray movie? Would it be something like that? <laughs> You should learn the piano. <laughs> um, he uh, has a breakdown. <clears throat> it's not actually from the war. Well, I guess everything's kind of from the war, but in, in the story, it's like, you know, already the 1960s or something where he has a breakdown. Um, he was treated in a veterans hospital near Lake Placid and was given shock treatments. Now, I, I really wanted to talk about this for a sec and we're gonna have a very, very slight digression uh, because isn't it possible that that's all this is? <laughs> um, I mentioned before that mental health is kind of a meta theme here. By meta theme, I just mean that it's, uh, if somebody were to ask you what this book is about, you wouldn't say it's a book about mental health. Um, but, you know, all of this time travel and aliens could be just to cope, you know, just coping mechanisms. 
he's given shock treatments. And uh, the digression I wanted to have here is I immediately thought of the 1997 movie, The Butcher Boy. <laughs> it's kind of a dark film. If, you're, if you don't have a strong stomach, I wouldn't recommend it. It's <clears throat> something like a horror movie, but it's not, it's, it's an art film. It's not, you know, like a slasher movie or something like that. Um, it's directed by Neil Jordan. It's a, it's a good movie. Strange, uh, really strange choices for the music. So I'm bringing it up because uh, the main character, Francie Brady, his name's Francie Brady, is a murderous child. He's, he's given shock treatments. And uh, when he gets the shock treatments, he immediately goes through this thing where he's like, hello, Egyptians, hello, pharaohs. He, he thinks he's traveling through time. The scene, <laughs> as dark as that sounds, is played in a very funny, lighthearted way with sort of 1950s or 1960s like rock and roll, like twist music playing in the background i can't really describe it i don't know if the sound is going to come through but i've put a clip i've put that clip in the slideshow uh as just a slight digression <clears throat> um so yes here's a little clip from the book this is that clip hopefully you'll hear it in this recording oops okay here we go Let's see if it works there are subtitles anyway Okay, that's not the scene with the, that's not with the, the the twist music. Uh something more like uh I don't know what that song is. I I can't think of it off the top of my head. Um in any case, check it out sometime if you want to. But I, I just the reason I put this in here is I wonder <clears throat> if that's something that happens to people who go through ECT, electroconvulsive therapy. We discussed that for a moment in the group and how it's just pretty barbaric. <laughs> way of treating a mental health issue. It's just past massive amounts of electricity, of electricity through the person's brain in the right area. Um, hmm. Yeah, I don't know what else to say about it. Uh, I, I kind of obliquely promised to, to see if I could find more references to time travel related to uh, shock treatment. I don't know if that's a thing that happens. <clears throat> Um, oops. Okay, so uh, early in 68, this is after that, <laughs> uh, a group of optometrists with Billy among them chartered an airplane uh, for a, an optometrist convention. The plane crashed on a mountain in Vermont. Everybody was killed but Billy. <laughs> so it goes. While he was recuperating, his wife died accidentally of carbon monoxide poisoning. So it goes. This is after his breakdown. Had a pretty rough time of it. I would probably start traveling through time also. Uh, so apparently the time traveling actually started a long time ago. Uh, he's just been keeping it secret because he knew how crazy it would sound. But one night he was uh, listening to, I guess he was listening to late night, radio, late night radio programs, decided to go to New York City and get on to one of those. He told about having come unstuck in time. He said he'd been kidnapped by a flying saucer in 67. The saucer was from Tralfamador. We'll be hearing much more about that later. He was taken to Tralfamador where he was displayed naked in a zoo. Um, he describes the Tralfamadorians they're two feet high, green, shaped like plumber's friends. Plumber, that would be like a, a plunger. Um, their suction cups were on the ground. Their shafts, extremely flexible, usually pointed to the sky. At the top, 
uh, was a little hand with a green eye on its palm. The creatures were friendly and they could see in four dimensions. They pitied earthlings for being able to see only three. They had many wonderful things to teach earthlings, especially about time. So uh, yeah, they kind of help him make sense of what's happening to him. Most important thing I learned on Trafalmador, Trafalmador was that when a person dies, he only appears to die. He's still alive in the past. It's very silly for people to cry at his funeral. All moments, past, present, and future always have existed, always will exist. Uh -huh. So comforting is how he describes this. Uh, when a Trafalmadorian sees a corpse, all he thinks is the dead person is in bad condition at that moment, but that same person is just fine in plenty of other moments. Now, when I find my, no, when I, let me try that again. When I myself hear that someone is dead, I simply shrug and say what Trafalmadorians say about dead people, which is, so it goes. Ah, so that's the origin of the phrase itself. Although I'm still a little confused how Trafalmadorians could have even the idea of something going at all if they live outside of time. Uh, maybe that's just how it comes through to us the tr translation or whatever. Uh, Billy first came unstuck during the war. He was chaplain's assistant, as I said. This is customarily, usually a figure of fun in the American army. Billy was no exception. Powerless to harm the enemy or to help his friends. In fact, he had no friends. He was a valet to a preacher, expected no promotions or medals, bore no arms, and had a meek faith in a loving Jesus, which mo most soldiers found putrid. Yeah. <laughs> it's something that has, <clears throat> for my entire life, struck me about, uh, I don't know, some people, I would say many, if not most, uh, use religion as a justification for being cruel and uh, arrogant, rather than sort of, you know, kind, compassionate, when he says a meek faith, it doesn't mean a small faith. It means, okay, meek can mean small and weak. It's not saying a weak faith. He's saying a faith that is not brash, a faith that's not arrogant and boisterous and shouting <laughs> at, at others. <clears throat> um, that yes, most soldiers would find putrid. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I think you guys probably have had some experience with this, whoever you are, listeners, viewers. Uh, when Billy joined the regiment, it was in the process of being destroyed by the Germans in the famous Battle of the Bulge. Billy never even got to meet the chaplain. <laughs> he joined while it was in the process of being destroyed. So he shows up and they're <laughs> already fighting, being you know, kicked to the ground. He never even met the chaplain. Never even got a helmet or boots. So he's wearing regular shoes, traipsing about in the snow. This was in 44 during the last mighty German attack of the war. Okay. I have uh, occasionally taken a few images from the graphic novel. Um, it's pretty good if you're into graphic novels. So he survived. Uh, but he was a dazed wanderer behind enemy lines. Three other wanderers, not so dazed, allowed him to tag along. Two of them were scouts. One was an anti-tank gunner who we're going to get to know very well. They were without food or maps. Avoiding Germans, they were delivering themselves into the rural si silences even more profound. They ate snow. Okay, so having a hard time, especially Billy without boots. Uh, Roland, the anti-tank gunner, he's... He's got loads of gear. He's almost over geared, as you'll see here shortly. Um, Roland, the anti-tank gunner, was only 18, uh, with the end of an unhappy childhood spent mostly in Pittsburgh. He had been unpopular there. He'd been unpopular because he was stupid and fat and mean and smelled like bacon no matter how much he washed. Um, the more you get to know Roland, <laughs> the more you also recognize him as probably someone you've met in your life. Uh, this is a person of a type. Uh, he was always being ditched in Pittsburgh by people who did not want him with them. So people tend to try to lose him. Ditching, if you guys are 
here to practice English. If you haven't heard that before, uh, ditching someone means abandoning them, losing them. Uh, so of course he, you know, got to be pretty angry about that. You almost feel sorry for him when you hear this, but well, you stop feeling sorry for him as you learn more about him because it's a person who is just cruel and uh, yeah, stupid, <laughs> just <laughs> insensitive, doesn't notice other, doesn't know how to pick up on social cues from other people. Okay, well, from other people, of course, but <clears throat> it made him sick to be ditched. Uh, when he was ditched, he would find somebody who was even more unpopular than himself. He would horse around with the person, pretending to be friendly, and then he would find some pretext for beating the shit out of him. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, He's a person who takes his anger out on other people with physical violence. Um, he's talking uh, with Billy about his special knife with three sides. This is just to give you a little glimpse of Roland. Uh, and a lot of this writing is just to give us a snapshot of the person, you know, he says, to Billy, this knife, it makes a three-sided hole in a guy. You stick an ordinary knife in a guy, makes a slit, right? Closes right up, right? Right. Shit, what do you know? What do they teach in college? <laughs> <clears throat> I wasn't there very long. He had only six months of college, and college hadn't been a regular college. It had been night school of the Ilium School of Optometry. <clears throat> Joe College. <laughs> I love that. It's like six months of optometry school. Joe College. Pfft. Just, you know, contempt for any kind of education. <clears throat> Said Weary scathingly. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm like holding back from commenting on the fact that <clears throat> contempt for education has become much more common now. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this Roland Weary type is... I would say kind of predominant, <laughs> well, let's say ascendant personality type. Uh, I don't know, I'll stop there. <clears throat> Joe College said Weary. Billy shrugged. There's more to life than what you read in books, said Weary. You'll find that out. It's like he's the wise man telling, you'll find that out. You don't know a thing, boy. <clears throat> Here's a great image of all of the gear that he had on him. Uh, I didn't put the entire list in quote, quotes from the book. Just this picture shows everything. Um, although there's a portion here quoted. Uh, he had a block of balsa wood, which was supposed to be a foxhole pillow. He had a prophylactic kit containing two tough condoms for the pre prevention of disease only. He had a whistle. And I love this because this is great writing. Just this sentence tells you so much about the person, <clears throat> tells you so much about Roland. He had a whistle he wasn't going to show anybody until he got promoted to corporal. <laughs> you, I mean, just think of that, that person. Uh, <clears throat> you, can, you can picture him, you know, admiring his whistle in private, <laughs> saying, one day. <laughs> But not now. He tucks it away somewhere, you know, not to be seen by anyone until the day he's promoted. And you can imagine he'd give a speech. He'd pull the whistle out and say, I've been saving this whistle <laughs> for this day. And then he would immediately start blowing it and he'd probably drive people insane with it, giving orders and blowing the whistle. He had a dirty picture of a woman attempting sexual intercourse with a Shetland pony. He had made Billy Pilgrim admire that picture several times. So it's more, it's just a bully. Like, look, look, it just pushes your face into it. Look at this. Yeah, you'll learn, boy. <laughs> so we get a little history of the dirty picture. It bears mentioning. There's a little bit of, there's a brief history of the first photo, um, the duck arrow type. Then two years after that, an assistant to Daguerre, André Lefebvre, was arrested in Tullier Gardens for attempting to sell a gentleman a picture of the woman in the pony. That's where Weary bought this picture too in the Tuileries. So, <laughs> in the Tuileries. Uh, 
it's okay. I, I just picture him getting scammed by you know somebody who's there to sort of you know, sell this stuff to tourists. Like, look what I've got. Hey, it's a. Uh, this is the origin. This place is the origin of this picture. Um, and <laughs> of course, Weary buys it and carries it with him, which is just funny. Like somebody who buys that picture and carries it around, like, look at this. <laughs> so Lefebvre argued the picture was fine art. His intention was to make Greek mythology come to life. He said the columns and potted palm proved that. So in the picture, there are some, uh, some like Doric columns, some Greek columns, and there's a potted plant. <laughs> he says, look, it's, it's art, it's mythology. Look at, the, look at those columns. Also very funny. Yeah, uh, when asked which myth he meant to represent, Lefebvre replied, there were thousands of myths like that where a woman and a mortal, woman was a mortal and the pony a god. Okay, so yeah, I mean, he could have <laughs> thought of, <laughs> I guess you need to mention, have a picture of like a goose or something. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so he was sent to six, sentenced to six months in prison. He died there of pneumonia, so it goes. So we talked about this a little bit. Why is this here? Why do we get this history? I'd say a couple of reasons. Uh, so first of all, again, there's the irony of this person who gets basically a death sentence for this ludicrous picture. Sure, terribly tasteless, but certainly not, you know, something that someone should be killed over. Um, and secondly, I think it's it's also there just to show that, you know, as soon as some technology comes about, there are almost immediately people who set about, you know, just trying to do something gross with it, <laughs> or even something evil. Uh, you know, think about. I don't want to you know ruffle too many feathers here, but think about the the bombings of uh, Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki also often compared to the firebombing of Dresden because the firebombing was, those are technically conventional weapons, uh, but completely leveled the city. Anyway, uh, Weary is coming up with uh, an internal story about the war, uh, how it's going, and it's hilarious because of course he is, uh, imagining himself as a great hero. The real story is that he was an anti-tank crew uh, that took one shot at a German tank, missed, and the German tank just <laughs> turned and just blasted them to, to smithereens, and he was the only survivor. That's the story. That's the real story. But in his head, it's like this. It's like a. It's like an action film. In his head, there was a German attack, and Weary and his anti-tank buddies fought like hell until everybody was killed but him. So it goes. Then Weary tied in with two scouts. They became close friends immediately. By the way, if you haven't read this, they're not close friends. <laughs> this is all in his head. They decided to fight their way back to their own lines. They were going to travel fast. They were damned if they'd surrender. They shook hands all around. They called themselves the Three Musketeers, which is totally made up. But then this damn college kid, so weak, shouldn't even have been in the army, asked if he could come along. He didn't have a gun or a knife. He didn't have a helmet or a cap. He couldn't even walk right. Kept bobbing up and down, up and down. So he's missing one heel from his shoe, and that's why he bobs up and down. Driving everybody crazy given their position away. He was pitiful. The three musketeers pushed and carried and dragged the college kid all the way back to their own lines. Where his story went, they saved his goddamn hide for him. So the part that I forgot to put in here is this is where he also uses that, that quote from Charles McKay's book. You know, he dilates upon his virtue and self-sacrifice or whatever it said, and services rendered to Christianity. Um, yeah. There's a callback to the uh, extraordinary popular delusions and the madness of crowds. Um, Billy Pilgrim had stopped. He kind of got away from his group. He was leaning against a tree. Uh, and this is where he has his first leap through time. 
uh, his attention began to swing grandly through the full arc of his life, passing into death, which was a violet light. There wasn't anybody else there or anything. There was just violet light and a hum. Then Billy swung into life again, going backwards until he was in pre-birth, which was a red light and bubbling sound. So what struck me about this, uh, although I think Yovana or somebody, I think Yovana, one of our participants, uh, who you'll see in some of the other recordings, uh, mentioned the red as being in the womb. I think that's probably a pretty good interpretation. Uh, but what else struck me is that this is, well, I'll just switch to the next slide and show you the visible spectrum of light. <clears throat> in reverse order. I guess it doesn't really matter if you're outside of time. Um, so yeah, a life is the visible spectrum of light, perhaps, for fourth dimensional seers, something like that. And also remember the, um, the, the outline he did of the book in crayon. He even says that the firebombing of Dresden was represented by a vertical orange column, which we even have here. Um, it says the blue line met the red line, um, but I don't know. I wonder if this is connected. It, it seems to me that it might be. There's not a lot of detail given about the, uh, the sketch on the back of the wallpaper, but it's, I don't know, worth considering. <clears throat> Uh, Billy's first leaps. It's funny because you could imagine that if Billy were going through psychoanalysis, these were like things that he would remember, you know, and the, the therapist would say, so why do you think you're, you're thinking about this? You know, that would be a part of his therapy. <clears throat> um, so the first thing he gets thrown to is his childhood where his father, to teach him to swim, throws him into the deep end where he sinks to the bottom of the pool. Someone jumps in to rescue him and he remembers <laughs> just having this sort of, oh, come on, really? Why bother rescuing me? Just leave me down here, please. He resents being rescued. This is how he's being right now too, behind enemy lines. He's always like, you guys go on without me. I'll be okay. Then he leaves to 1965, visiting his aging mother <clears throat> who takes every ounce of her strength to summon forth the the question, how did I get so old? Um, in the waiting room, he reads about a soldier executed for cowardice, uh, which of course is, <laughs> you know, he survived the war. He could perhaps if he had made it into the fighting been like this guy because he had no desire really to fight. Uh, but, you know, as a chaplain's assistant, I guess he wouldn't have been put into the front lines. Uh, then he leaves to 1958. This one's a little bit of a mystery to me. Uh, he's at a Little League banquet. For those of you who don't know, Little League is uh, baseball for, for young kids. Uh, here's the quote. The coach who had never been married. I don't know why that's there. Had never been married. Why is that detail there? <coughs> was speaking. He was all choked up. Honest to God, he was saying, I consider it an honor just to be water boy for these kids. If you think about the uh, psychoanalyst, <laughs> you're like, why? why is that there? Why are you thinking about this? Why did you leap to this spot? <clears throat> I guess maybe it's a contrast to, uh, it's sort of there to remind us of things that he could never go back to after being so traumatized and seeing things he could not unsee that he could never really, I don't know, get back into that reality, that reality that the coach lives in. Um, 1961, drunk and being unfaithful for the one and only time, as he says, at an optometrist party, wild stuff over there I've heard. Uh, he passes out in the back of his car while searching for the steering wheel. So there's a funny scene where he keeps running his hand across looking for the steering wheel. And eventually he just passes out and it turns out he was in the back seat. Um, 
Then he goes back to 44, where Roland is shaking him awake. Uh, Roland kicks and shoves Billy back to the scouts. Here he is, boys. He don't want to live, but he's going to live anyway. When he gets out of this, by God, he's going to owe his life to the three musketeers. <laughs> this was the first the scouts had heard that Weary thought of himself and them as the three musketeers. <laughs> so the scouts are also like, <sighs> and of course, what do what did people do to Roland in the past? Well, they ditched him. They told Weary that he and Billy had better find somebody to surrender to. The scouts weren't going to wait for them anymore. They ditched Weary and Billy in the creek bed. Hmm. <laughs> if you guys have ever seen Full Metal Jacket, I just pictured this Vincent D'Onofrio character at this point. The, the Kubrick stare, it's in some other Kubrick movies. Uh, represents the point at which the character has completely lost it. <laughs> Weary was filled with a tragic wrath. He had been ditched again. Uh, it's a, I think, fitting picture. <laughs> um, so Roland proceeds to beat the ever-loving crap out of Billy. He was, Billy was involuntarily making convulsive sounds that were a lot like laughter. You think that's funny, huh? He walked around to Billy's back. Billy's jacket and shirt had been pulled up around his shoulders, so his back was naked. There, inches from the tips of Weary's combat boots were the pitiful buttons of Billy's spine. So, you know how I mentioned before that you almost feel sorry for Roland? Well, then you kind of say, no. I mean, here's a person who's not just beating someone up, but intentionally now intends to do permanent harm to this person uh, with malice aforethought. Uh, he drew back his right boot, aimed a kick at the spine at the tube, which had so many of Billy's important wires in it. <laughs> so Billy's describing himself as a machine here. Well, I, sorry, the narrator is describing Billy as a machine. Weary was going to break that, so his spinal cord. But then Weary saw he had an audience. Five German soldiers and a police dog on a leash were looking down into the bed of the creek. The soldiers' blue eyes were filled with bleary civilian curiosity, like hazy. Civilian curiosity as to why one American would try to murder another one so far from home and why the victim should laugh. So they also thought that he was laughing. So that's the end of chapter two. They're taken prisoner. Uh, so it goes. Um, and here we talked a bit about the so it goes phrase, among other things. And I'll just splice on the bit of video from the other session here in a second. But so it goes uh, sort of represents uh, the inevitability of things, the arbitrariness of things. Uh, in the plague, it was the weather. The weather doesn't care about you. The universe has no judgments about anything that's happening, has no opinions, goes on with its business, regardless of our situations. Um, I think that part is in the recording, but I figured I'd mention it just in case. OK, so um, for next time, of course, three and four. Ah, well, that's going to be in the recording. Okay. So see you guys soon. Take care. Have a good week or a couple of days. And yeah, uh, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Great. Um, yeah, that's that. Bye. He was um, like a lamb, so he was meek. And his name is Billy, and I'm not sure, but I think Billy is a um, male goat. So, hmm. yeah, there might be some sort of um, inversion or irony. In well, it's also Billy is William, which yeah. is Will I Am. <laughs> um, th th there is actually a little stretch about. Um, why he calls himself 
Billy as an adult, but it's unusual for someone who's a grown up to continue to use Billy because it's sort of the child's name. Um, so that's in the scene where he's uh, cheating on his wife and the lady asks him, why do they call you Billy? And he says, for business reasons. <laughs> and it was true. His father said, his father taught him that people would see him as more friendly if they have, if he has this sort of childish name. Um, but yes, his meekness and mildness certainly uh, allude to, let's say, a more sublimated form of uh, Christian pacifism, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't even really think about the Mary part, though. Thank you for that. I didn't really notice. Cool. Yeah, uh, yeah and the narrator at the end of the first chapter, he uh, he says that he's like a lot's wife, so he turned around. And, yeah. yeah. So yes. In our one of the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, ways. Uh, very good. Yes, Nevena? Uh, can you explain us what is exactly the relationship with the narrator and the Billy Pilgrim? Is the Billy Pilgrim uh, simulate uh, the experience uh, of uh, 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 outer narrator um, uh, uh, existence in the that raisin bombing and uh, prison? Shelter, prison shelter. What is the? Uh, is it mm -hmm. some kind of uh, how to say uh, similarity and connection? What is exactly? Sure. Is it some? I, th I think that he, uh, you know, in chapter one, he's giving us, you know, true uh, biographical details from his life, and Billy Pilgrim is a fictionalized version of him. I mean, he's. Uh, and, you know, who knows, maybe he does get unstuck in time in real life. Who are we to judge? Who, do, who are we to know? We can't know. Uh, and that's, you know, I, we mentioned men, mental health as a kind of meta uh, topic here. And I wanted to kind of bring that up with the shock treatment. It could be that all of this is just coping. All of this is just coping with what he witnessed. Um, nothing more, you know, it's possible. And or, about, uh, mm -hmm. about the, uh, that uh, medical treatments, uh, when the Billy um, uh, came from the war, uh, uh, they um, uh, ended in the mental uh, hospital mm -hmm. and uh, because of uh, war trauma. And uh, I... Uh, can make a conclusion that uh, every trauma in the life uh, 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 can um, uh, uh, disapprove the, <laughs> the mental health and the stability of the human existence and bad mm -hmm. um, uh, relationship with, uh, with other people, uh, some um, disagreement, uh, bad situation also also like a war situation uh, can uh, totally um, dismantle the whole mental sta status of the some person and uh, family and uh, environment uh, relatives and uh, uh, other uh, neighborhood of this person who suffer from some kind of uh, uh, yeah, it's been um, it's been somewhat of a, a scandal in the U.S. that uh, the uh, veterans' healthcare system has been quite lacking. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard about this. Yeah. Um, and I mean, so World War II is widely considered the last just war. I Okay, maybe, not, I don't know. Most people would agree that there had, something had to be done. <laughs> um, not everyone, but, uh, and when you think about getting mental health support for participants in a just war, that, that's, that's one thing. And support was better back then, but still by no means, uh, great as far as mental health support. 
Um, <clears throat> but now, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't want to opine too heavily in front of all of you guys, <laughs> but the, um, I think what I would describe as pretty unjust, unjustified wars happening and leaving people traumatized, sometimes, oftentimes irreparably traumatized with almost no mental health support and a kind of culture around the soldiers thinking that discourages them from admitting that there's a problem at all <clears throat> or acknowledge because <laughs> a part of that problem involves acknowledging what they've done. Uh, that's how you would get through it. And it requires a kind of admission, not just about the soldier himself, but about the nature of those global efforts, <laughs> what they're really trying to do it requires a bit of uh, soul searching. For what reason did I these things? <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not so much, it, it, that's not what's presented here. That's, it's just a bit of an aside. I mean, as, there's not a question of, you know, are Kurt Vonnegut or Billy Pilgrim asking about the terrible things that he himself has done. That's not what this story is. Um, but yeah, um, not sure what else I should say about that without going off on a huge tangent. Um, Anybody else have anything to say? Yes, Nevena? I just want to uh, ask uh, you uh, what, uh, why the narrator used this phrase, so it goes. Um, mm. Is it some kind of, uh, how to say, um, absurdness of uh, the humiliation or some? Uh, the, uh, the, the author was, uh, want, to, want to say that. Uh, um, never mind, everything is uh, like uh, that, and the, the, uh, everything well, is goes so wrong. But never mind, everything is goes anyway, anyway wrong. <laughs> what, what is the well, why he, he used the he explains it as what the Trafalmadorians say, but uh, I think uh, your reference to absurdity, I think is somewhat on the mark, but uh, arbitrariness. Arbitrariness mm -hmm. is <clears throat> the lack of reason or meaning. This is something we talked about in the previous group uh, for, the, for uh, the plague. The plague is a large arbitrary event. Uh, the weather in that novel plays a part the weather is always expressed as something that doesn't care what you're going through. So even though there's a huge play going on, there's also the sun is shining or it's decided that it's going to uh, thunder and, and storm. Um, so it goes is just, again, the uh, unreasonable <laughs> uh, silence of nature and the universe, which doesn't care about what's happening to us it's indifferent. It has no opinions on our, our suffering or our joy. And so it goes is a very good, very short expression of that. It's the unfeelingness of the universe itself. The universe goes on. We're just a speck of dust in, in the, the big picture. Uh, things go on as they will. We can do nothing about it. And that's, I hope that answers your question. <laughs> and uh, maybe, uh, maybe it is uh, just one kind of uh, literary devices uh, the author uh, is using uh, like once upon a time and this, so it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's his, it, it's a uh, short and to the point. Yes, it's yes. impactful enough that short and sharp. you can find a, decent number of college students in the US who have it tattooed on them somewhere. <laughs> um, okay. Well, in that case, 
that's it for now. Um, for next time, go ahead and read uh, the next two chapters. And I want to remind you, if there's something you would like me to put in the slideshow, let me know. I can do that. I don't want to be the only one piloting this ship. Uh, uh, this uh, background of yours is uh, absolutely, ab absolutely admiring. Uh, it's excellent. Oh, thank you. Uh, can we have that background too? <laughs> this one comes with Zoom. Just look in the menu options. You can find it there. That it's one of the ones that come for free with the with the mm -hmm. program. Okay. okay. Yeah, I was pretty happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> I like fun. that you can put film in the background. I thought about putting some other. You can put any video back there. Just you know, I thought about putting something ridiculous, but I don't want to be too distracting. Okay. Okay. So that's it for now. Uh, I hope you'll all come back next week and we can continue with our story. It was a very interesting session we had Thank tonight. You. Glad you enjoyed You're it. Having. Yes, I enjoyed it. You are a pretty uh, amusing. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm nothing if not amusing. <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> so I'll see you guys next time and have a good week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 See you. See you. Bye. Bye bye.